Blah. <laughs> How are you doing tonight? I'm doing okay. Welcome to another installment of this epic, huge, deluxe, supersized, eerie Vaughn interview. Career spanning, blah, 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 blah. I say this every month when I release another section of it. This is the second to last section, and I just want to remind you that it's not the whole enchilada. In order to get the whole enchilada, you got to become a YouTube member or you got to join the Patreon. If you do one of those two things, you will be able to hear our entire conversation. If you are watching this publicly on the YouTube channel, that means you haven't seen part two, you haven't seen part three, you haven't seen part six. You've only got to watch part one, part four, part five. This would be part seven. Part eight will be the last part of the series. All together, you're looking at about five-ish hours of Eerie Vaughn talking about all things Misfits, Sam Hain, and Danzig, as well as a variety of other topics. That's not the only thing that you can find when you become a member to either the Patreon or when you become a YouTube member. There are tons of other goodies, various things that I had to take off my YouTube channel, videos that are only produced for those memberships, secret shows, hours and hours and hours of this style of content, and more. Unreleased feature-length films, and I'm always adding to the pile. Whether it's viewer support, whether you are subscribed, whether you are sharing these videos, I'm super duper grateful to all of those who are already members. Thank you for your support of this content. Most importantly, I am constantly trying to think of new creative ways that I could entertain with the content I make with these videos. That includes a whole bunch of unreleased Misfits interview related content from my archive. Okay, the PSA is over. Thank you. Peace and hair grease. We'll see you next month with the last final concluding part of this saga. And you'll probably hear some variation of this message to go with it. And then that was all done in real platinum. Yeah. And that's just fine if you wanted to make like, you know, voiceover things, but and the drum sound was horrendous. Jesus Christ. I hated it then. No, that's what makes that record. That's what makes those records sound so crazy is because you recorded in this crazy environment. No, it's just that we recorded with a drum sound that works better on the dance records that they were putting out. Right. But not, not the stuff we were doing. And I don't know. I'm not a drummer, but I know what I don't like. You know, what do you mean? So you are a drummer. A drum- you, are, you are a drummer, Erie. Come on. No, uh, at not really. I can sit behind them kid and keep time. Oh, come but on, man. You dude on that on that Rosemary's Babies record, you're freaking a drummer, dude. Like you're and on the Mis- Misfits collection too, you're drumming. I mean, you're drumming. You're you're a drummer. Yeah, I was just baking it on the Rosemary's Babies just play as fast as you can. And the Misfits stuff, I was just co- copying whatever Googie would have done, but you could tell I was I was I was a drummer. I was just some guy who was playing drums. You know what? You, know? you you're not giving yourself enough credit. You're not giving yourself. Yeah, enough credit. I, but I don't really care. You know, like you, it, it's okay yeah. if people like it, but I'm not going to say I'm any good. But I think I play better drums now. But I play a lot more smooth. You know, it's not so hard rocky. It's still nice. I play more like a a jazz. I'm uh, not jazz, like a blues vibe. You know. You keep in time and your fills are shorter. They're not a lot of rolls, but they're they're kind of more like Ringo, like tasty fills, you know. Oh, I love Ringo's. Yeah. Ringo's drumming. People, let me tell you something. I hate it when people bag on Ringo and don't understand how brilliant he was behind the kit. And you know what makes Ringo brilliant? Restraint. Restraint. He's not flashy. He plays to the song, and that's what makes Ringo great. I think. Well, yeah, well, that's we were saying that before. It's like you know, it's what you don't play, you know, that makes the difference. It's knowing what to play and when to play it, 
and a whole bunch of little tiny things that most people don't even know they're there. Right. And there's a reason. And that's also like rhythm things some people you, you say this is how the song goes and it's going this way for an exact purpose and then you go oh you mean like this and they just cut out this rhythm part or this thing that you're doing you know and you're like no and you got to show it to them again you know so uh yeah it's all, all that stuff is for a reason i'm so, so upset with my phone shut my phone off um you call me that is I mean, that's crazy. That's really crazy when you think about it. And then you guys played. Now, here's what's really interesting. You guys took out a lot of bands that ended up just fucking exploding. Like in the 90s, like you, you took out Soundgarden, <laughs> like, Soundgar- like Soundgarden. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? Soundgarden was huge. No. I know. I'm just saying it's such a ludicrous answer for me to say, like who? Oh, oh, like oh, 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 sorry. I just wasn't picking up on your sarcasm. Yeah, like try not. To, yeah, try not to hit one of them. You right. Know. That's what. But it's just kind of incredible yeah. how you guys picked these bands and like they just it's like they they had the Danzig touch. The Danzig would take them out. You guys would have them out and then they would just go on and they would just be like, I mean, you got to, you played with so many incredible bands and bonded with them, you played with White Zombie, played with friggin' um, uh, Marilyn Manson. But it was like, it, Marilyn Manson was the band Marilyn Manson. It wasn't like, uh, now it's more of like a solo thing, right? Like he's, he's not, it's not the same, uh, I don't think it's the same sort of <gasps> entity. No, it was, a, it was a, at the time, it was uh, more of a band, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, like they seemed to hang out with each other, and um, they've contributed a lot more. Right. Than, than I think later, you know. Right, right. And, um, yeah, it's just kind of, it's just really, really kind of crazy and profound. You just you just got to freaking tour the world. Oh, you went down to New Zealand, and you guys... What was it? It was a Misfits cover band or it was a Samhain cover band? And then you were like, move over, guys. Let me show you how it's done. And you guys played a couple songs uh, with their gear. You weren't prepared to play or something? Do you remember anything about New Zealand? Um, (coughs) I thought it was, maybe it was New Zealand because I liked it there. Um, I thought it was like South America. I was trying to look at a photo somebody posted that I was just trying to figure out what kind of gear they were using. And I got, you know, they speak English in, in New Zealand, right? They sure and do. A little harder. They're a little harder on it in South America. And I'm trying to remember the band um, and if they had an accent or anything. But yeah, there were, you know, over the years, in the beginning, we, the, the four of us hung out a lot more. Like, you know, like you're supposed to do when you when you start a band you think everybody lives together and they all go out together and they all have fun and they love doing making music you know like the monkeys or something you know and right uh, right we tried to we tried to do that and of course when you're a certain age and it is that you have a lot of the same interests but glenn's already 10 years older than everybody else and he just wants to go to the comic shops and strip clubs and stuff like that and Chuck has no use for the strip clubs, but he'll go to the comic shops, but he doesn't have any money. John doesn't care about the comic shops, but he'll love the strip clubs, but he doesn't really like Glenn because he tries to tell him about how to play guitar. You know, so it's a little, and I'm in the back going, yeah, I'll go out with you, Chuck. Oh, yeah, I'll go out with you, Glenn. Oh, John, you want to go to the gym? Okay. So you're the glue. You're the glue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Had to be. Somebody had to be. You know what's interesting? Uh, This is an observation that I have right now in this moment, and it's based on what I've heard you say in interviews, so you can't get mad that I'm regurgitating (laughs) anything. No, I'm predicating this. so you're just going to tell me what I already know. No, I don't know. Maybe I won't. Maybe I won't. But what's interesting... You want me to tell you if you're you're correct? Yes, that's what this whole fucking conversation's been about. (laughs) Oh, I know. I know. I know. um, No, but... What what is interesting or what's profound is that you're always you're always sort of like ragging on yourself as like, oh, you know, I like can kind of play. I play, you know, I don't yeah, Glenn kept me around. Like you say that a lot. I you've you you've you you say that all the time. 
but I think one thing you're not taking into account, or maybe what should be taken into the account is, to, is the fact that, that you were the glue for the band and th- how important the glue for a band is you just said it you just broke down the dynamic the all the interband politics but how you were the guy who could hang out with all of them maybe glenn saw that too and that's why like that was your additional contribution in the band amongst all the other things you know what i'm saying like that you are the glue and that that is a very important element in keeping the band together well, yeah, I think the people forget these days, you know, and it's not like it's a long, long time ago, but mostly, um, yeah, it had to be a delicate balance. It's like a recipe or making a cake or something. You take one element out and it doesn't taste right, you know, so sometimes you need you need to know what your role is, just like in a, a regular relationship, you know, you need to know when your role is. If you're the bass player. Well, suppose you're a really good bass player, but it doesn't really work if you play as much as you can play here. When you got a great guitar player over there playing there and you got the singer singing his ass off, maybe you should play a little bit less. So each guy's got to think that way. And then that's how a good band happens. You know, everybody, you're, you're working for the song and for the good of the band. That's when a good band happens. And we did that, you know, at least for the first eight years or so, you know. And then what happens if, okay, so what happens? So Chuck leaves the band. He, he quits or gets fired or however, whatever happens. He's, he exits. Whatever happens. Yeah. I forget. He exits and, and Joey comes into the band and the chemistry changes or, or correction. Does the chemistry change or correction further? How does the chemistry change in that kind of way? Well, for one thing, you know, the drummer is so important to the band and there no, there's really no two alike. And Chuck could just do anything, but he had his individual like feel. It's just every drummer does, you know, and Joey came in and he brought a little bit more different energy because he was like a cholo, you know. And uh, his, his, all his relatives, everybody was like, you know, and uh, and he and he's like, he loved the shit. Plus, he came from punk rock background. He was in punk rock band. Um, so and he was very enthusiastic and he was such a nice guy. And he was definitely not a ro- boat rocker. So after we tried out like a bunch of guys, um, he was one that we thought we could we could use him. You know, like we, it wasn't like we we given up up trying to make get somebody as good as Chuck. We just said no. We need somebody who works. You know, so we practice hard with him. Me and John, like probably every day for a couple of weeks, and he got to where it was good. But he's more. He seems more of a basher to me sometimes, like a more hard rock drummer, like they have nowadays. Even though. I look at pictures of him playing with the circle jerks. I was like, Jesus, he looks like an old man, you know, and he's got, he must be, uh, you know, five, eight years younger than me. But uh, yeah, so he was, it was just different. John and I tried to maintain the thing, but by then, you know, I think John was already gone, you know, it's hard to tell, but. He knew the date he was going to make the announcement and he had thought it out, you know, and stuff. So he was, he was already in his mind, you know, like you see in the, the Kramer does, you know, I'm already there, Jerry. You know, right. like, I think that was a good was like Kramer. That. that was a really good Kramer. <laughs> no, seriously. That was a good Kramer. So, like, I thought it sounded like Michael Richards. That was funny. Yeah. All right. <laughs> For a second, you thought of him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that was the whole deal. And, uh, it, yeah, it changed, but it would change, you know, like just even if John just dropped off, we still had Chuck, it would have changed the whole dynamic because John, uh, John was too metal for Glenn and he wanted something. He didn't like the fact that the guy played better than he did and that he couldn't come up with the ideas that this guy could come up with. You know what I mean? It was just one of those things that he didn't feel comfortable. I think this is my opinion. Right. He didn't feel comfortable with the guy knowing more than he did. And he maybe felt like he was talking down to him or 
I don't know. Maybe it's just my speculation. But it, it seemed like he always wanted to have guitar player that could play chords and stuff, you know. But uh He finally I gets the secret he finally gets the secret weapon that takes the band to a whole nother level and then but based on what your speculation is here, like it's not there's there's a there, there's a whole other edge. There's a whole other side to it, you know, with with all that sort of stuff. Well, maybe it's just a punk rock background, you know. I don't know. Could or is the you know didn't uh, you know punk rock is uh, defy authority and all that shit and question authority. You know, it could be that. I mean, I have a problem with uh, with authority now and again. Um, and right. nobody likes to be told what to do. You know, you sure. just have to tell them in the right way. You know. Which is also something you learn in a band, you know. You sure. learn how to talk. To, you learn how to talk to your fellow band members so they don't, so they understand where you're coming from and that they, they don't get upset. You said, "Oh, you know, oh, it's this, it's that." You go, eh, "Let me talk to him." You know, I know how just how to talk to him. Yeah, you do a lot of that stuff. It was fun with Glenn, though, you know, because you could just uh, reverse psychology was my favorite because you could just go, "Yeah." And whatever he was bitching about, you just say, yeah, you go after that. And you go, and then you go, yeah, you know, and then you say, OK, and then you don't come back for like 20 minutes. Then, then you see him and you go, well, are we leaving? And he'd be like, nah, I think we'll do the show. I'm like, all right. And I'd walk away and that'd be the end of that problem. Um, Somebody, one, uh, one of... One of the bass players on a late in a later Danzig lineup, uh, Jerry Montano. I don't know if you know who, if you're familiar with him. He. I can't keep the. I can't ke- keep all those guys. You know. I figured. Names I figured. In my head. Jesus Christ! What has it been? Twenty-seven bass players. Yeah, there's been a bunch, but <laughs> he he said something similar. I interviewed him on the show, and I, he said something similar along the lines of like, "This is when he was there when when Glenn started playing with Doyle again for the Misfit songs." And um, it was something like be like 10 years ago. That was like it was 2004, I think. And oh, there you go. And Glenn, as Jerry tells the story, that Glenn like came up to him or something and was like, and was like, uh, should we do the Misfit songs or like I'm thinking, oh no, or maybe it was like I'm thinking about doing Misfit songs, and that Jerry realized that like he could not get excited at the notion of playing Misfit songs because if he got too excited, then Glenn would go, nah, fuck it, we're not going to do the Misfit songs. So he had to just be like, yeah, I guess that would be kind of cool. And then Glenn's like uh, something like uh, like all right we're doing the Misfit songs and then like that's what he had wanted the whole time <laughs> like the the exactly what you said as you said the the reverse psychology it's just interesting it's interesting how that works it's psychology man it's psychology one hundred and one at the end of the day right like yeah that's true never never open the book never right never open the book um, but that's that's really interesting that uh, one one other question in in regards to that. You said that John had kind of, or something along the lines of like John was out of it already, or like feel like he was going through the. It sounded like what you're saying is that he's kind of going through the motions. Do, when do you think? No, that no, be- I didn't say that. That's no, no, I didn't say any of that. I said it could have been that in my, you know, 
to me, in my mind, he he could have been already gone. Like he had thought oh, oh, about oh, right. it. Thank you and, for clarifying. No, but Thank he you was for clarifying. But he, but no, he, we talked about it, and you know, when he said this is the date, I want to, you know, tell everybody that we're leaving the band or whatever, and uh, and he he said, but I'm gonna I'm gonna play till the till all the dates are done. She said, I'm gonna do all the videos. I'm gonna do anything that I have to do. I'm Go to photo shoots, all that stuff. Like he was a rock star, he was to be professional and do his job. And I said, exactly. I said, that's fine. You know, you do that. That's all we can expect from me. You know, and th- that's good. Yeah. So that's, that's a good that's way, the way to approach it. But he, that's a good way to leave for sure. Yeah. He, he, also, you you don't want to like you don't want to call Ozzy Osbourne when he says, "Hey, how's this John the Christ guy?" You know, you don't oh, want to say, sure. "Oh, well, you know, he, he didn't." You know, he didn't do this. He didn't do that. You know, yeah. Or he yeah, left yeah. this early. He left this in the lurch. Or he stole. He stole the amp. He didn't play pay for or whatever. You know. Um. So that no, oh, that was fine. No, he never went through the most. He just didn't really understand the last record too much. You know, like he kept telling me the songs aren't finished. The songs aren't finished. You know, like we, we, they need more. We need more rehearsal. You know, it, it, it's they sound like demos. You know, like I think he said shit like that. I think he definitely needed thought we songs weren't finished at all do like you think another part or whatever you know was that like the cattle do you think that he had that he had been sort of like feeling his exit earlier or do you think that was the catalyst like that the songs aren't finished on four like i don't know about this or do you think that no, he probably no i think he th- th- that didn't have that much to do with it that was just towards the end of his being in the band Gotcha. You know, like it wasn't a, I don't think he sat around and said, I'm quitting the band because of these songs or any of that kind of shit, or I'll do these songs, but I don't like them. You know, no, I think he was already quitting the band. He was just going to finish up. It needed to be a new record. He was in the middle of it. Right. So he had For to sure. finish it. He's, you know, no, I don't think it had anything to do with it. He probably, I, he might like some of the stuff. He, he did, he did some nice guitar work on that record, you know. Oh, that, that, listen. Yeah, I like, I like some of the stuff on there, you know. That is revered. I mean, four is revered by fans. It's like just, you know, and then there's that whole thing. I, I've heard you guys say this in interviews back then where, you know, that it has like, and I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I, I've tried to listen to the record as like, you know, that it has like a Sam Hain feel or like a Sam Hain sensibility. And I don't know. I just don't see it. Like I, I don't know what I'm missing from from seeing it that way. But that like that there's like a Sam Hain vibe to Danzig for that. This always gets said in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. I, well, no. I've been saying it for the last thirty years. So I don't. That's probably just come from me because I don't remember saying it then. But I know I've said it in like every interview I've ever given since then. I said, you guys just don't get that record. And I just you said it saying, then. You, you said gotta... it back in 94, you said it. Well, sure. all right. Well, then for I've sure. been saying it for longer than that. Yeah. You know, so I just said, yeah, you got to listen to it like it's a Sam Hain record. But I don't mean the entire record. You got to listen to certain songs. If you put them up, you put them in a mix with some Sam Hain songs, you put them at the end and you go, oh, this is might have been what Sam Hain sounded like, you know, a couple of years later, whatever. That's what the point I was trying to make. Gotcha. You know, and a lot of now, now all I hear is people going, Oh, it's my favorite record. Oh, you know, you just got to listen to like Sam main record. You know, I'm like, you know, I wish I would have thought of that. We should have told John that. Right. Right. We talked about album layouts. Let me ask you this. Are you familiar? Do you use Photoshop at all? No. Are you familiar with Photoshop as like a software or just completely? Yeah. 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 I, somebody sent me uh, like their copy of it. Like it, 2008 maybe or earlier than that whatever version of that but no I, I i could never make heads or tails of it so no if i ever had to do anything i either get somebody to do it who knows that and i tell them what to do or i have to go to the kinkos and cut and paste it together well that's good. literally you're segueing into my statement of what i want to say the idea that when you're doing like the rosemary's baby album cover or when glenn is doing any of the layouts that he did for any of his records, at least, uh, you know, up until, you know, November coming fire. Um, the idea that like before you had Photoshop, which is what I use exclusively for everything. I designed everything in Photoshop, but the idea that you're doing all of this stuff by hand that, you know, if you want to merge layers, you have to Xerox it. That's how you merge a layer. 
you don't just click a button you have to actually go to kinkos you have to put all the shapes on the you know the paper that you want and then you got to glue them with a glue stick or whatever you're choosing to do and you know maybe bump up what is it like when you bump up when you like xerox it like several times it gets that really interesting kind of look I don't know what you call that. You run it through the Xerox machine like eight times over. Yeah. No, what we used to do was we would just, it was mostly necessity the way you get that kind of look. You didn't start out for that kind of look. You wanted it to look as good as you possibly could. But you usually had, it was these horrible photos that you were getting out of magazines that were usually, you had, a, you tried to copy them and they all came out gray. So you were like, shit. So you had to copy them and keep hitting the lighter button, lighter, 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 lighter. So it started to look okay. But then people would start doing artwork to them and stuff like that and started doing a lot of, you know, Sharpie stuff and, you know, just all kinds of crazy shit. They, no, most of that shit happened by accident out of the necessity. And they would just go, there was, some, yeah, there were some guys who were really good at it. They could, they could take an old horror movie photo, a lobby card or something, print it, and then drop it in the font. You know, but they're still cut and paste of the band, but it was the right one and had the right skull and all this stuff and put the, the address and then he would do it in three different colored paper. And, you know, he that kind of. But for the most part, it was all horrible kids just writing. It's at the old barn at two o'clock. Be there. You know, that kind of shit. You know, um, Th- those are so funny, like a Black Flag cover album. Yeah. You know, yes. Album cover. Yes. By the way. <laughs> As the night has worn on, oh, you, you started you probably doing love Black Flag, huh? Who me? Oh, you know I've covered them on the show. They're okay. They're okay. I mean, like, you know, there are some songs. No, I meant the album covers. What the just in general the album covers? The album covers. You probably think they're great, huh? They're okay. <laughs> why no, are you Why are you great. laughing at me? I think they're okay. I I never I don't wouldn't say anything bad about them. Wouldn't say anything good about them. They're just Black Flag album covers. Like what? Yeah. You don't like you don't like good. Raymond Raymond uh what's his face's uh illustrations? Uh what's his what's the dude? Um brother, uh, no, Greg never Ginn's, heard of him. Greg Ginn's brother who did all the illustrations. Oh, is, is you're kidding. What now I mean? understand. Understand what? Well, well, of course. No, you you know, why wouldn't you give your brother the job? At least he's like your mom. T- Right, I gotta let him design your album cover, and he'd be like, "Hey, okay, well, keeps him out of the refrigerator that we got buried in the backyard." Okay, we've got fine. a. This is an eerie Von Lounge act that has slowly evolved throughout this like conversation. I'm loving it. It's like literally the best thing ever. It's really, really great. Um, the blood shows. What's up with the blood? You you douse yourself with blood. Does that have to do with some sort of is that like trying to like uh, tie into like a, some sort of theme of like sacrifice in some of the the imagery or the lyrics that Glenn is writing about the decision to do it? And this is something I didn't realize until tonight. The fact that that blood show was with the Minutemen and it was it was on November 3rd at the Metro. Right. And that's right before D Boone died. D Boone died like like yep. six days later. You guys did a yep. show with them. Yep. Um, <laughs> that's crazy. And you know what's even crazier? It was 22 days before I was born. <laughs> oh, yeah. What Do you remember anything about the Meat Men? The, um, not the Meat Men, the Minute Men. Do you remember anything about the Minute Men? Were they like, what the fuck are these guys covering themselves with blood? Or were they out the door by the time you went on? What was the deal? I remember, they, remember that one guy was fat. d That's all I remember. Yeah. Were you not? You, weren't into the, you were not into the Minutemen. No, are you kidding? I don't know. No. Did no. you like any no. SST band? No, not a single one. Not even Black Flag. I like the West Coast stuff, man. It was my thing. No, I was. I was by then. I was like listening to like psycho, like shit, like fetus, and you know any and anything that like goth chicks dug, like Bauhaus and stuff like that. You know. I'm going to go no, see Bauhaus no. in November. I saw them when they still I'm together. Excited. I'm excited. <laughs> I've never seen, I've never seen them. Never seen them. My friend's taking me. I saw them on the, I saw them on the reunion tour too, which was in the nineties. <laughs> it was like 10, 15 years after they broke wow. up. That's pretty awesome. I like yeah, that. I saw them re- there too. Yeah. 
In the Flat Fields is a good record. Which record? I like that record. In the Flat Fields? I like it. I like all their singles. Um, I, I've got them all on seven inch. You know, it was four AD. I love that record label. He used to put out good records. I love four yeah, AD. I love all that shit. Um, so, are you into the Pixies at all? You know the Pixies? No, no, not particularly. No, the, the old lady likes the Pixies. Oh, love the Pixies, they, and they're a four AD yeah, band. I just, she's like, how can you not like the Pixies? And I said, well, you know, <laughs> let me just explain something to you. All right. For once, for one thing, you have to have a friend or uh, somebody that you associate with who's into that band that says, "Hey, I think you should play. Listen to the Pixies. You might like them." I go, "Oh, well, why don't you play some?" Yeah, and then you go, "Yeah, you know what? I'm going to buy this record. Oh, I really like this band. Then I'll then I'll take it from there." Well, I didn't have anybody who's into well, the Pixies. Well, I'm recommending so nobody you. Nobody turned me hey. on. To- Hey, I'm telling well, how, you right how now. Could I, how could I do it? Right now, I'm telling you that you need to go listen to Doolittle. Go listen to Doolittle by the Pixies. Your uh, Mel will will agree with me that you need to go listen to Doolittle. When you, when you see her next, you tell her, hey, the guy I was talking to all night, he told me to go listen to Doolittle. Do you think he's a right to do, that he's right to recommend that? And she's going to say yes, and you're going to listen to it and all that stuff, all that like death rock shit you're into from the eighties and stuff, you're gonna hear all of that DNA in the in Doolittle, and it's gonna melt your face off in a great way. You're gonna love it. That's 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 my prediction. Dude, eerie fucking Vaughn, man. Eerie fucking Vaughn. What a fucking show. What a show this was. I think we got through fucking everything, man. I mean, absolutely everything. Um, Although you didn't explain the blood shows. Hey, guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a patreon what is patreon i don't know how to define a patreon let me look it up patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating i want to do it full-time i want this to be my full-time job in my efforts to make that happen i've set up this platform is it going to work is it going to be successful i don't know but i would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all the goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full-time, uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk, and I never shut the fuck up. (laughs) So right now, I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers, and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes, that's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Well, no, we wanted to do it because we like Carrie. So that was it. Is and that he'd really always it? To do with the that's it. No, well, he told me he wanted. He told me he wanted to do it with the Misfits, but they didn't want to get the they didn't want to get this stuff in their hair or whatever he said. I don't remember. But he said, I said, you mean like Carrie? He was like, yeah, it'd be so cool. So we wanted to do the buckets just like that. We had to put it over each guy's, you know, area by in front of his amp and stuff. But we happened to be in a place we couldn't get the string up. We couldn't get the ropes up there. So we said, oh, we're going to have to go mix it up. We mixed it up in a big thing, and it was it was like a six foot pool of blood. The dressing room was great. I'm super. I was like, how come we didn't take pictures? Nobody had a camera. I'm like, oh fuck yeah. Wow. Right. So anyway, so we just mixed it up. Glenn knew the recipe. Of course, Glenn knew the recipe. No one's gonna question him on it. It'd be exactly two drops of, of yellow with the two drops of red or whatever, or you know what he had a recipe. So um, so we just poured it on each other. London's like, don't get it in my hair. I swear to God, I was like, oh, my God, this guy's in the band. So me and Glenn just went out. We just, like, tried to do this show. Glenn splits his pants. His balls are all hanging out. It's all covered in blood shit. It's hysterical. And, you know, it's like I can't I play because my hand's all stuck to the guitar. And oh, shit, my Lord. To the bass. And I keep pouring water on top of it, and, you know. And I totally went out and did the Gene Simmons thing. I had a, my mouth full of blood with an eyeball in it. And I just went up to the front row and just went, Bleh! <laughs> that was great you know that was a lot of fun and then yeah Gua- we just wanted to do that we, you know yeah then yeah then everybody's doing it that was right guar like, guar did it the happy. first the first danzig show guar slayer is- did it yeah. yeah yeah but that had never been but in at least okay to cite erie's book so he doesn't think that i'm trying to regurgitate facts to him in erie's book you say that that had sort Here of said it, then it's still another fact. So, yeah. it, what was that? You said in your book that this had never been done before. That you guys, oh, I don't know, I don't know. If you don't actually that's know. What Glenn that. told me. That's what Glenn told you. No, I don't know anything. No, it's like the, I thought we were. I didn't see. Anything. You think that album cover? You would see. You would see a version of that somewhere down the line from the sixties or whatever. Or from the seventies, I because I've gotten a lot of album cover books. I pay attention. I like music. I didn't see anybody else doing that, so I was like, "Hey, maybe we got it from Carrie, and that's as far as it is, you know." So, but I didn't see anybody playing covered in blood. I mean, sure, maybe they did it. I don't care. Who, who gives a shit who did it first? No, that, I mean, cool. I, I just realized that's right. <laughs> technically, technically, it's the first album cover. The first album cover has, I mean, Initium has the blood on it too. But that's where that, yeah. that you had done it even before that, that it was that it was there. It's one of the greatest album covers that ever existed in the history of album covers. You know. Yeah, he told me he wanted to do it with the Misfits, but they weren't into getting that blood on them or something. I don't know. He said they didn't want to do it. That's all. It was just pretty much, you know, I didn't go, gee, Glenn, why didn't they want to do it? How are they feeling at the time? Maybe right. you, you should talk about it. That that sounds just, like something I, said, I would say. Eh, that sounds like what I would ask, yeah. Glenn. That's exactly how I would ask yeah. you. What 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 do you think he meant by that? See, me and my friend Darren, we think it means this. You know, we've been sitting in our garage for six weeks talking about this one particular noise on this one song. <laughs> and you know, you know, whatever. It's like, oh, I was talking about the Matrix on this colored vinyl. You know, you know, there's not there's not five thousand copies. There's five thousand one hundred two copies. Really? You know who has the 102 copies? Some guy lives in a submarine. Yeah. Big dance band. You know what a submarine is? It's black. It's got a skull on the side. Yeah, he lives 500 feet under the ground. Listens to Danzig 4 all day long. Yeah. Uh, he knows God. all about that. He's got the 102 copies right there. It's what he, you know what he does? Uses it for fuel. Yeah. Because that's what oh, you can Lord. do with that Danzig record. Do you, do you think these Danzig re- these just whatever these records in general? Do you think that the 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 market bubble is gonna pop, and eventually, or do you think it's gonna keep growing and growing and growing? Oh, well, over time, the uh, the stuff that Glenn's putting out now is just like oh, I'll pass it on every colored vinyl there is, and in like ten years from now, they'll all be worth money. Um, so that stuff, yeah. But the the other shit is just gonna do what the comic book uh, stuff did in the eighties. Uh, the people who have the money are starting to look at stuff like this as an investment, and they're going to buy great copies. They're going to put them away. 
10, 15 years from now, they're going to pull them out and they're going to sell them for like twice what they, what they paid for them. So it's a better investment. They did that with the comic books. Glenn, you know, was way into comics. He was like, oh, this is what's going to happen. And I was like, yep, I can see it, you know, because I was collecting too. But it's the same thing. It's just like the stock market. It's the r- records, baseball cards, all that bullshit. It's uh, all very up and down. Uh, I was. It had a little bit of a dip of a couple of years, maybe five years ago, because I was kind of getting the feel it maybe burned out. But with the reunion stuff and all that shit, when that happened, then it's like up. Oh, now it's all back up again, and now the prices are ridiculous. Yeah, it's definitely going to go down. I mean, I don't see how it could. But the, those people are the people are going to get the good shit. They're going to sit on it, and then it's going to bust out in another ten years. But if nobody does anything, if everybody dies or whatever, you know, it's up to you people to make it make the next stupid record or the, the legacy fifty thousand dollars or whatever that is. Oh you my know, lord! We'll all be in our grade. You know. <laughs> I think the I think the current I think the 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 highest paid item I've seen on eBay is thirty five grand for the original art of Wolf Wolf's Blood. That's the highest I've seen any single thing go for although i'm sure if if those teenagers from mars acetates were were around that they would probably go for i don't know i mean i'm just making up numbers like i don't know like fifty thousand dollars if you're judging by just insane amounts of money just it just someone who has the disposable income who has the ability to buy that stuff would probably pay a, a hefty price of that variety you know who knows? Well, last I, I heard it was real expensive, and that was probably 10, 10 or more years ago. It was like the Evil Live 3-pack. Right. When had the extra 33 records and no sleeves, and he went out and printed up <laughs> 33 sleeves. And he's like, I'm going to sign and number them. And you know, that that went for like 10000 one time, like yeah. way back. Yeah. I was pretty, 10 I years was pretty ago. impressed. Uh, 12 then, years ago. 12 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, yeah probably. Something and then like it was that. up to like thirty thousand. That's as far as I knew. But like, I remember when you you could still get all the records for like nothing. Like, you know, you know how much the Misfit records costed when they were in the store? They were like three to five dollars, maybe for the uh, for the singles. You know, three three to five is all you could expect, and five is if you had a lot of balls, man. Mostly, you you had a bag. They would give you a dollar fifty, and they'd sell it for three dollars. So if you got three dollars, they were selling it for like six dollars or five dollars. That was big time, you know. I was I was getting a dollar fifty a record, and I had to beg them to give me that. So that's who likes to do that shit. But that's how much the records were. They were sitting on the counter or behind the counter in a bin, in a bin with the punk rock records or with the hardcore records. Three dollars here, minus Brett, five dollars. You know, hey, there you go. Um, what about okay, Bleaker Bob's? Um the like at some point when this stuff started to get pricey that glenn would go in there and sell those dudes or wait no i'm trying to remember what it was that that they would that that bleaker bob maybe maybe it wasn't glenn maybe it was somebody else who told me the story that that bleaker bob would begrudgingly buy stuff back because it was so valuable at higher markups than what he originally sold it for because he was trying to something yeah, like everybody that. everybody who buys and sells does does that yeah everybody who buys and sells does that they they see that you know like um you know they bought a painting that or they had a painting they really liked and then they sold it and now it's gone way up but they have a chance to buy it again and they know it's going to keep going up plus they right. really like it yeah definitely i see that going with vinyl plus vinyl people you're all nuts you know so bleak kebab was a big collector um he had the oh i love the clocks he had so many great clocks um yeah oh fucking love that story you were talking about john the salvo from the tough dots who i interviewed um, for he used to uh, let yeah. Us, yeah we used to let us stay in the fucking store the two two three hours after it was closed on saturday nights you just play records. Just John, play that one. Oh, he goes. Oh, you got to hear this. This is a new record from so and so. And then just play that. Say, oh, let me, you know. And it was always try it before you buy it, like in the old fifties days, 
where you used to take them into the booth and you could listen to it. Um, we say, oh, you know, put on that new Metallica record. I want to see what it sounds like or whatever. And they put it on. He go, yeah, I think it's pretty good. You know, oh, I think you'd like it. You talk, talk about it, whatever. That was great. You know, it was a good store. Bob was a real character. I, I you know, I was, I, I had some pictures. I think I was going to make a poster to put in the studio. That my friends <coughs> built it that I thought would be, you know, he might get the joke. It's just a big picture. Bob by the Castro uh, with a big dopey smile, a big fat belly, you know, and uh, he was, what a ball buster. He, I, he was the greatest. He was such a ball buster. Oh, I loved him. He's the greatest. Yeah, so I got two pictures I'm saving. I'm going to make a poster. <laughs> I think that's awesome. No, but did he did he, he kept things, things started off like if you, you go into a store and it's like, hey, I, this is my band. I want to like, can I put some here? And if you sell them, you'll give me some of the money. Like consignment. Was Bleaker Bob big on, oh, yeah. on that sort of thing? Could you explain a little bit about that? How did that work? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, everybody, you could do consignment. You still do it today. Any Anybody will do consignment. Yeah, you go, all right, you know, uh, give me the money for half of the records and give me the money when the other half sells. You know, that's basically it. You come in and you go, well, you got, you know, did you sell any records? You say no, and you keep going. Go, all right. Well, I want my records back then, and he's, then if you don't have the records, he's got to give you the money. That's all. Right. It's no big deal. It was pretty common. They t- you, just like anybody would take. Hey, I'll take six bucks now, and you owe me six bucks later. You know, stuff like that. Uh, right. You know, and I, right. I remember taking Glenn into the city, and he had records in the trunk or whatever, or he was just like, I just got to run into this record store, and he had like. You know some of the misfit records that he was just gonna sell. Just, go in and give me give me ten bucks for each one of these. Give me twenty bucks for each one of these. You know, and he, that, he that's how he would make lunch, but have some lunch or whatever. Um, I remember when he was printing all the records on. Um, he took all the color out of the artwork, so they were all gonna be white vinyl and they're gonna be white sleeves and stuff. He was, he was getting them all printed. They weren't heavy cardstock; they were a little bit less. Get them all printed on one. Um, 18 by 24 sheet and he was just going to cut each one out as he needed them you know and I was just like yeah he was making he was really banking on that he was like this is going to make this is when the misfits were really you know they were all everything was gone it was all Earth AD and Sam Hain and stuff and the misfits were starting to sell some some records and these records were becoming like collector's items and stuff I was like yeah what the fuck it looks cool why not you know it's like, yeah, nobody's doing white vinyl. It's great, you know. It's like the Dickies did white vinyl. You know, I kept thinking all my white vinyl. You know, Stranglers did black and white vinyl. Yeah, you know. It's like, why not? Who killed Marilyn? Uh, no, that was Halloween, Three Hits from Hell, and, and something else, I think. I think it's just those Might two. Have been Marilyn, no, Die, Die, My yeah. Darling? Die, Die, My Darling? No, that, no, not as a seven inch. No, he did white vinyl on Die, Die, but it was still a 12 inch version. But yeah, he did. He did. I thought he did three. Might have been just two. I, I had the uncut sleeve, but I saw it with somebody. I can't remember. Um, but one of them, I'm not sure if they were all white vinyl. I think maybe a couple of them. Were white vinyl. I three hits from Halloween were both white vinyl. I think well, they, well, they had a red label. I can't remember. But, but yeah, both of those were, or at least from what I've seen, they both seem to be uh, white vinyl. <laughs> 